I'm going to try to take it slowly because it's so beautiful and so rich. And we are following this text. It's an ancient text. It's actually from the 8th century called the Guide to the Way of the Bodhisattva. But this is a secondary text on top of it by Pema Chodron. And she brings a much more applied and psychological lens to these ancient teachings. And for folks who have been sitting here with me before, you know, I really like that applied psychological lens because that's how we live our lives, very relationally, very much in community with one another and working with all of our wonderful, difficult emotions. And the text is really divided up into three main parts. The first part is kind of inspiring us. Why should I become a bodhisattva? Why should I dedicate myself, my practice, my heart for all beings? Why would I do that? And then the second part of the text is very clear, and I would say um, penetratingly precise instruction on how to cut through all of our bullshit so that we can have an open heart for all others. And the third part of the text is really around how do we sustain it? Because I think sometimes, especially on our, our best days, when we don't feel rushed, we had enough sleep, just enough caffeine, like we're naturally generous and kind, like we don't even need to try, right? But then, you know, it's too hot or too cold or too windy or we're dehydrated, it goes out the window, right? And the idea of this text is how to really deepen the training of our heart and our mind um, and kind of an emphasis really on cultivating the clear wisdom mind and also the heart of compassion. And that if we're doing that on a day-to-day -day basis, this compassion warriorship just comes naturally. We don't even have to try. It's even said that it starts to come in our dreams. So just throughout our waking life, we are beings of compassion. So that's, um, yeah, really beautiful. And today we will, we're still here on the first part. We'll be going through some of the verses. And the way the text is set up is there are these kind of paragraph long verses and then commentary by Pema Chodron on those verses. And in this context of the well of being here, we generally do a meditation, which we'll do shortly. Then we kind of have a bit of a discussion on practice itself, and then go over some of this text and do questions as well. So many of you I know, and you are familiar here, but for those who are new, welcome, welcome, welcome. And the way that we really like to engage in this space is, is building community. Because we could totally just be at home watching a recording or reading something, and um, that would be of some benefit to us, for sure, and likely benefit to others if we're a little bit more available as a result. But when we are learning in community, not only from a kind of a learning perspective, often we will retain more, but just this idea that we are endeavoring to wake up on the path in order to be with each other. So it's actually helpful to do this together. It's really important. It doesn't feel like this thing we do on our own when we have like our candle lit and like the perfect thing going on. Like, no, like we're doing this all together. There might be fireworks because, you know, it's 4th of July, we're in the mission. Could be loud, it's hot. Like we are sitting with the discomfort of, you know, being embodied together and there's a real value to it. And so, Part of the way we do that is to really engage our practice of compassionate listening and our practice of compassionate speech while we're here together so that we can be in community and we can show up in a way that feels relatively safe. Or as a lot of folks who I, uh, I work with say, there are no safe spaces, there are just courageous spaces. So creating a space where the heart feels strong, that it can share, it can listen. So tonight, we are an incredibly unique community of gathered beings. It's never been like this before. It'll probably never be like this again. And so to feel the preciousness of that and being together, like that's huge. And so before we begin in practice, in as like non-creepy a way as possible or feels good, 
just like look around like your little community for tonight. You can smile and giggle, no problem. Yeah, we're here together. And we are really fortunate to have Serana at the door so we can feel extra fierce protection. And we can see our friends online. Hi, thank you for being with us. Yeah, and you know, each and every person, you all could be, you know, whiling out with some ice cream in Dolores Park right now, but you chose to be here. And that's a huge gift. Every person being here is like a huge generosity. So to just feel that as a, a way to settle more deeply into this practice and this opportunity. I know we're tired because it's hot. So we'll try to do a practice that's, you know, pithy, but right. And we are going to do a practice of Tonglen. I know a lot of folks are familiar with this, but the, uh, the brief description is it's a compassion practice that uses kind of symbolic imagination to transform what we normally would try to push away. We actually invite it towards us. So we try to push away difficult feelings, difficult thoughts, other people's problems, right? We actually kind of open and actually invite towards. It's going against our habit. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, you as an individual, but like kind of just the habit of trying to push away from what's hard and um, move towards and often grasp onto what feels good. And in this practice, we imagine and, and bring to mind someone who has difficulty, and we then make that difficulty represented as a form. Sometimes the form is called dark smoke, sometimes just a contracted tight space, whatever visualization works for you. And we literally invite in a transformation of this dark tight space or smoke into the space of the heart, the wisdom of the heart, the openness of the heart. So it's like we're bringing in that fog that comes over the hill. Hopefully it'll come over soon. And when it comes into the sun and it gets totally dissipated, right? And the sun is the heart of compassion. And so for this practice to be effective, we have to really feel the strength and the power of the heart. So really feeling into that capacity of the heart and sometimes people have a little aversion, this idea of drawing in, you know, darkness or heaviness, but you're not like bringing it into your lungs, you're not inhaling it, you're just bringing it up to the surface. It's already there, right? The people you love and worry about, your concerns for them, it's already here. We're just kind of like making some space for it. And energetically, through our imagination, letting it be transformed by our love into a totally different phenomena, generosity. So Tonglen is the kind of practice of, you know, inviting in and extending out. And it's uh, one that we can do also, you know, every breath, every moment. You know, today when I was um, riding my bike down here while the wheel was still working, um, I saw someone who, you know, is experiencing homelessness and looked very uncomfortable and um, maybe sick or ill in some way. And in that moment, you can do Tonglen, like recognizing the difficulty, imagining it as this dark smoke or contracted space and extending out just this sense of light, clarity, peace and ease. So it's a very generous practice and one that can help us start to work with this accumulated sense of um, kind of heart heaviness that we have for the world around us. So that will be our practice. And I'll give some instructions of how to take it easy um, if it feels heavy and how to kind of continue to come back to a space that can feel safe, especially in the belly. Um, if it starts to feel like um, you need an anchor outside of those heavy feelings. So without further ado, take this very unique drumstick by, donated by Noam since our uh, actual uh, implement ran away. And let's find, especially for tonight, given the heat, finding a posture that feels right. Finding a posture that feels really upright 
And so that can be this sense of the elongated spine. So let's inhale our shoulders up to our neck and then exhale them down our back. Feel that broadening of the chest, inhaling our shoulders up. Exhale, squeezing the shoulder gates together. And one more time. Really finding a softening through the face and the chest and the belly, right alongside that lengthening up through the spine. Let's take a moment and really find ourselves situated in this place. Sensing the air around us, the sounds around us. Feeling and imagining the earth beneath us. Feeling and imagining the sky above us. Allowing our body to settle in its natural state of stillness, its stability, ease. And this isn't just a kind of falling into a dullness. This is a real filling of our attention, saturating our attention through the body. So though the body is still, there's so much vividness in the stillness. And the mind drifts away, no problem. But a couple more breaths here, really pouring our attention and awareness fully into the body and being curious about the experience of this body, all its undulating energies and sensations. Maybe our attention could even feel appreciative, grateful for this body in which we get to sense this world, all its joys and sorrows. And then we endeavor to help settle a bit of the inner speech into silence by following the breath. So narrowing our focus from sensing the whole body to sensing the rise and fall of the breath. 
We can do so by noticing the very subtle sensations at the nostrils. What a refuge for our distracted mind to have this one place to tether our attention. Each breath, a full cycle of meditation, just riding the breath, noticing all the sensations as air travels in through the nostrils, and then again makes its exit through the nostrils, just a bit warmer. If you feel sleepy or dull, no problem. Focus a bit more on the inhale, inviting that vividness. If the mind feels busy, agitated, then allow yourself to focus a bit more on the exhale, relaxing, finding release through the exhale. It really doesn't matter how many times you get distracted. Just keep coming back with care and gentleness. And we stay just a bit longer here, giving our mind this refuge of the breath. And then for just a couple moments, reestablishing the sense of stillness and stability in the body, silence and with the speech, and inviting the mind in its natural state to feel open and warm, no longer focusing on the breath, but instead allowing the space of the mind to feel vast and open, no boundary, no perimeter. Almost as though we were the vast night sky.
And then connecting and sustaining even a glimpse of this vastness and openness. This is the very first step of our Tonglen practice, feeling that openness, that spaciousness. In some ways, the opposite or the antidote to the contracted, tight, hard feelings. And we begin by connecting with bodhicitta. This is the aspiration of the heart to awaken for all beings. And this might feel far off or foreign. Maybe it's very close, just like your own skin. But it's just that stirring, that desire to be of service, to care, to show up, whether that's for our immediate friends and family, or we feel that call to the world. Notice if we can feel the flicker or flame of that within us. It's our natural birthright. And so letting the vast spaciousness also have this warmth, this care. And it's okay if this feels conceptual, just imagining what it could feel like in the body. And if there's a felt sense, just notice what is this warmth and vastness like in the body? Where is it sensed and felt? What's the quality of sensation? And the next step of our Tonglen is to bring to mind a being or beings whom we know are experiencing distress and difficulty, challenge in some way or another. This could be someone we know well or just someone we've read about in the news or seen. And for a moment, we really vividly bring to mind this being and their suffering. And we imagine that we could invite and through the generosity of our heart, hold some of this difficulty, that this burden so hard to carry by this being or beings is something we could help them carry. So we imagine part of their difficulty or distress transformed into this little cloud of smoke. We could envision it hovering right in front of the belly button line. And feeling and engaging, again, that generosity of heart, which wants to be of service and to care. And the strength and courage of inviting. So feeling or seeing, imagining this little cloud of smoke hovering in front of the belly button line. We also feel and imagine the warmth and capacity of our heart. We could imagine that as golden light right in front of the heart area. If visualization is tricky for you, no problem. Just imagine what it could look like. More important here is the intention and aspiration of Tonglen.
inviting in in order to transform. So again, flashing on an image of this being or beings, really feeling the potency of inviting this little cloud of smoke right in front of us as a way to help them alleviate the suffering and burden. And with our next inhale, we draw in these tendrils of smoke up to the light at the heart. Then we exhale, joy, peace, ease. And continuing with the visualization, a symbolic representation of a willingness to open the heart with compassion. Drawing in through the inhale, these tendrils of smoke, radiating out like burning off the mist through the sun of our heart, radiating in all directions. If words appear, that's wonderful. The phrases of compassion, may you be at peace, may you know ease, may you be protected from inner and outer harms. Feeling that as just piercing through the dark smoke with this radiant wish of compassion. Just two more breaths, really drawing in with this being or beings in mind. Exhale, radiating out. And then releasing the image, releasing this exchange and coming back to that sense of the vast warm openness of the heart mind instead of directing our compassionate energy and awareness to one place Imagine our compassionate, warm energy just radiating in all directions. Not through any effort, just through its own natural luminescence. Breathing in, simply feeling and connecting to vast, warm spaciousness. And breathing out feeling a sense of being vast, warm spaciousness. Any sound or thought, feeling or image that arises in vast, warm spaciousness can simply be included within it and folded within it. Whatever arises is smaller, shorter, less dense than 
this unconfigured natural state of the heart mind. And if there is any feelings of enjoyment or pleasure, just from being in this state, this nourishing state of heart-mind, you can gently offer this up, considering that we extend this just as well as we extend our wish of compassion, sharing our joy, sharing our peace, really helps undo the clinging that we can have for these states that feel good. Extending and expanding them. May all beings know peace and warmth and presence. May all beings feel at home with their heart and their mind, even for just a moment. The mind still feels busy, no problem. Just keep leaning back, opening. It can be edgy to stay in these more expanded states. Can feel groundless or possibly self-indulgent. We'll take a moment remembering that our bodhicitta our commitment to all beings requires that our heart-mind is nourished, clear, open, and warm. Very gently coming back into the breath. Regathering our attention through the inhale and exhale, this time at the belly. Breathing in and noticing the gentle rise. Breathing out, feeling and noticing the gentle fall. Breathing in through the nostrils and breathing out, gently opening the mouth. And again, and releasing. And one more time. Feeling this body supported by the earth and the sky. Supported by the gathered community here. And supported by the unbroken lineage of teachings for thousands of years.
when the bell rings, seeing if you can maintain some sense of presence, awareness, and warmth with the body, the mind, and the heart. Not uprooting completely from this place in order to be with one another. Thank you for your practice. And if you had a nap, no problem. Or many naps here and there. So we often take time now to reflect on practice and ask any questions. It's kind of blows my mind. I was talking to another um, teacher and researcher about how little there is available in our contemporary teaching of meditation to reflect on our practice. For most of us, we're like, I did it, and now I got to do those 10,000 things that I said I was going to do, in, you know, like we're just fresh. And we actually don't take the time to think, what just happened? And also, what's the current quality of my heart, my mind? Like, what might have shifted? So I really welcome those kinds of reflections and also any other questions about the practice, um, any challenges or any uh, insights, knowing that there are a lot of us, so keeping it pithy, if possible. And, you know, when we're speaking, of course, Really speaking from our heart um, as opposed to from our ego can be confusing. But, um, you know, what really wants to be shared, it can be very helpful uh, to hear other people in this space. I am always just totally blown away by the practice of so many of you and what, what you share here. So, yeah, look forward to questions or reflections, friends online, or here in, here in person, we have this very awkward situation where there's a mic in the center of the room, but it can be passed to you so we can make it work. How was that practice for people? Um, I don't really know what I want to say, except that that practice, speaking of reflection, went really well um, as far as they have been going not so well. Uh, so <laughs> this one, I think just being in the space and having you here, it seemed pretty stable. Great. And so thank you for yeah. that. It was, it does feel like a refuge once it's gone. And, you know, I always catastrophe them like, oh, it's forever. Gonna right. Be the worst. So when you say it's gone, just what does that mean? Like when the mind just won't stop or? Yeah, I think that when it just won't um, be stable or like I keep getting lost and yes. I don't have that warm, yeah, pleasantness. Yeah. Um, to relax into. Uh, but one thing that I am going through is I had the privilege to go to Kim McLeod last night at the Olympics. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he was really talking about intention and attention um, and asking yourself why. And I guess I, I'm trying to come to the intention more, especially mm -hmm. as we're going over yeah. this particularly. Yep. Um, as to freeing all beings or why am I doing this practice? And I could hit on it a little bit with the Tonglen of like, oh, I'm doing it for this person who I know has this one specific thing. But as just a general matter, my intention of like why I come here, why I have found, you know, so much refuge and how do I accept the Bodhisattva path? Mm. 
um, and why am I doing it? So I, I don't really know what the question is other than to like how to make clear the intention and how to totally live with that intention, you know, during the day yeah. Um, and how to sort of cultivate, like, I feel like I know how to, you know, I can do an attention practice to increase my level of attention and totally. like they kind of have to be balanced. Um, you know, you can have one dose higher of the other. And so I feel like I'm missing the intention. And so I'm just trying, I don't know how to raise that up. Yes. Or do an intention practice. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and such a, uh, a great framing for today and what we're going to talk about too. Um, and if those didn't hear, um, Ken McLeod is like such an amazing teacher. It's like, yeah. at the Alembic for the next six weeks in person and online. Um, really beautiful Vajrayana teacher. Um, I bought it online, but I didn't watch it. So I look, I look forward to hearing it. And, you know, I think this question of, you know, it's funny because most of us, like, actually, I'd love to do a poll. Who came to meditation because life was kind of painful and hard in the first place? And then many. And then like when life's like, okay, you're like, wait, why am I here? What am I doing? And so it can, it's kind of fun. I mean, but then luckily life shows up with more suffering. We're like, oh, right. Where else would I go? There's nothing, there's no, there's no escape. Um, right. There's no ground or there's no parachute, but there's no ground. So it's okay. Um, I think, you know, I think the intention and like what brings us back over and over often is to alleviate suffering and it starts with ours and then what's that bridge to feel like it actually implicates others you know it's not just alleviating my suffering like isn't that enough and we really live in a in a very confused time in a very confused time where i think because of you know our current kind of capitalist or you could call colonized mindset and understanding of the world is so kind of extractionist. Like we're like, I need something to feel good for me. We actually lost sight that there is no good for me. Like that's actually a, a fantasy, a, a fallacy. Any sense of individual well-being is so sensitive and so uh, susceptible to the suffering of others. Like we actually can't just be okay. Like that's not possible because the air we breathe is from the fires that are happening up North. Right. And the pollution that we're all excited, we can look at that at the global climate level, but even in our, our micro circles, like you can't actually be okay without attending to the okayness and goodness of those around you. And that's natural. That's not codependency. It, it, it can become codependency if you're not okay, unless everybody's okay. But it's not actually that, I mean, though it sounds really heroic, like I'm a compassion warrior. It's like, there's not another option. There are really no other sane options for being with like the volume and amount of distress, difficulty and suffering, even within our own like small worlds, like our friends and family. And then maybe the radical or outrageous part of the compassion warrior that it's for everyone, it's interesting, there was a quote I wanted to read um, as an opener, but this is perfect for your question. This is Pema Chodron talking about um, one of the verses we'll read tonight. Sentient beings are as countless as grains of sand in the Ganges. Because there are more than the mind can grasp, the wish to save them all is equally inconceivable. By making such an aspiration in order you know, to wake up all sentient beings, our ordinary confused mind stretches far beyond its normal capacity. It stretches limitlessly. And when we expand our personal longing for liberation to include immeasurable numbers of beings, the benefit we receive is equally immeasurable. In short, the more we connect with the inconceivable, indescribable vastness of mind, the more joyful we will be. So in some ways, it's like this, when we start to, there's like this paradox we, we talk about here sometimes that like thinking about our own suffering and the suffering of the people close to us is somewhat intolerable. Thinking about the fact that everybody suffers is somehow very normalizing and easeful. Like it's so weird 
but check it out, right? So there's something about our self-centered, egoic clinging to our own well-being and making things okay that actually makes us miserable. And so one very practical reason to become a warrior of compassion is to feel good. <laughs> and that's okay. That's absolutely okay. Not only do we like, it's not just that, oh, that's an okay place to start. Like that has to actually be part of the path the whole time. Right. This is not an austerity practice. So I'm going to give up all joy and happiness in the world for the sake of others. It's I'm going to increase all the joy and happiness in the world for myself and all others. Right. So I think I think we some of us can kind of take on this. If I'm feeling good, then I'm kind of cheating. Right. But spiritual practice is, is not just seriousness. It's also like the deepest joy that can be felt because it's not a temporary joy. It's really, you know, that, that lasting sense of joy or sometimes like another version, like the joy and bliss of blamelessness, like living in accordance with our values and our virtues. It feels good. So great question. Yeah. He, and keep letting me know how the intention unfolds. Yeah. And I think one, sorry, one, uh, such a long answer. I'm sorry, yeah, but I'm sorry. no, no, no. It was a great, great question. No, no, that, that was my lack of pithy. Uh, remembering, you know, setting the intention all the time. So you said like, how do I remember? Cause I don't think it's a matter of being clear on your intention. I think it, comes to you, right? But how do we keep it, you know, sustained throughout the day? That part's harder, yeah. you know? And that's why we effortfully practice it so it becomes reflexive. And I do think the more we notice our reactions or our lack of reactivity over time, the more we see that these seeds we plant, they do start to become kind of how we respond to the world without having to think about it. Like, what would I do if I was a bodhisattva right now? Like, no, we're just responding with generosity. So, yeah, thanks. Thank Other questions or comments on the practice? Yes, Jimmy. I found this great um, thing online. It's it's. 10% happier a conversation between Pema Chodron and, and Dan Harris mm. talking about the um, the path of Bodhisattva, mm. talking about what is in this book. And she she does bring up Shanti Deva's text and the stuff. And and the the one of the things that she talked about was making that daily intention. Mm to um, put the needs of others before my own, not in a doormat kind of codependent kind of way, but just in, in that very kind and compassionate sort of considering other people. And to do this every morning, mm. sometimes, and she talks about a, a, a friend of hers who's a practitioner, who was saying that it's it's not enough to do it every morning sometimes for me. I gotta do it every hour. <laughs> yeah. Get it all throughout the day. Yeah. Remembering. Yeah. Remembering. Yeah. Remembering. And and again, it's it's 10% happier with Dan Harris and Kevin Children. It was reported this past September. Mm, so it's relatively new. Yeah. And it's great. Mm. It's really a good conversation. Yeah. yeah. There's really a lot of um a lot of discussion of how to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that she brings up is that we hear a lot about what we ought to do, um, but we don't hear enough about how mm -hmm. to implement these spiritual principles in our lives, yeah. generosity and compassion and, and thoughtfulness. Yeah. So, Beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. So. Yeah. Yeah. And she, um, you know, in this book, we get into the paramitas or like these spiritual quality, which is the kind of how, like, what do we need to do to enact this on a daily basis? And like, what are the, what are we, what are the qualities that we are um, infusing our everyday mind stream with? It's very important to be aware. I mean, it's, it's, most of us are pretty clear if we are honest with ourselves on what we're energizing, right? On a day-to-day -day basis, 
who's energizing distraction? Yeah, like there's a lot of distraction being energized. Okay, like how, but how do we also include, you know, redirection of attention, compassion, like generosity, enthusiasm. It's really being clear, not, not to like put ourselves down or again, try to get into some austerity regimen with ourselves because that doesn't work, but just like, just like a garden, like really, what are we, what are we planting? What are we harvesting? What are we weeding out? Um, it's really important to be thoughtful and that's, that's intention. It's not just something you do at the beginning of your practice and you let go of. It's like, okay, I'm look, I'm reaching for my phone or I'm going to start watching this series of shows. Like why, what, how, cause you can bring an intention to vegging out. You're like, I need this. Like I have really been taxed this week. Like I don't want to think I just want to laugh or I just want to cry. But if there's an intention, then it's beautiful. Like you're really feeding yourself. But if you're kind of like hiding it from yourself or without intention, it's a very different quality. So just interesting. Okay, any um, other thoughts or questions before we get to the text today? Yeah. Um, uh, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> Yes. yes. Can't see you. Oh. But you, um, that's okay. Oh, okay. hey. <laughs> Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, I guess like just a quick thought and question. Uh, uh, the, to be honest, this was, um, I, it was a really good practice. I, I mean, I think it was a really helpful practice, but it was a little bit challenging for me today. Um, just because I've uh, kind of been going through some stuff. And uh, uh, how do I put this? Um, the people I was thinking of uh, are people that I have some, especially one person that I have a lot of uh, mixed emotions towards, including anger and sadness. Uh, and um, I, I guess like a question I had, like you were talking about codependency earlier, and um, I think that's something that I personally struggle with. And I was wondering if you like have any um, sort of ideas about how how to do like this um, this sort of practice, but without uh, without going into the codependent territory. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. It's such a great question. And thanks for your honesty um, and transparency of heart. I think, yeah, I can't even say I'm like in recovery of codependency. I'm just aware. <laughs> it is, um, you know, I do think it's, I, I think it gets a bad rap, I will say. Maybe I'm just being defensive, but um, it's so natural to care for others and for others' well-being to matter to us. That's beautiful. There's, there's not like a hot and like parents and, you know, partners and it, it makes sense. Like we want to do that for those in our life, our kids. It's, it's natural. I think the difficulty is when we forget that there is a fundamental goodness here and we're seeking all of the love to be like, we're giving the love to receive it back. And so there's two, two parts of a response to your question, but I, I will make it pithy. And one way to work with codependency is to really continue to kind of forge a sense of basic goodness. Like I am already okay, irrespective of what I do, who I do it for, how I do it. It's a really, really, really important, beautiful, deep, difficult practice. And that one we can do um, either doing loving kindness practice for ourselves, compassion practice for ourselves, but also just in the world, I, I kind of like call it like taking credit for the love I already give to myself. So like I'm taking a nice shower and I'm like, this sandalwood soap is dope. Like I got this for myself. It smells so good. I'm nice. I'm good to myself. Like I'm good. Like just this sense of like harnessing the goodness we already give to ourselves, like feeling the goodness and the love we already have for ourselves and letting that, you know, we can kind of like do it from the outside in with these nice things. So feeling, you know, feeling the warmth on our skin from sun and then noticing like, is there a warmth from within? 
And I hope in this practice, some of you did experience like a warmth that that is from within, right? We're generating the compassion for others. And then we recognize that compassion is here. Um, so I think one part of working with codependency is returning and remembering over and over and over to the goodness that we already are, you know? So I think that's one piece. The other part you mentioned, which is really important, is when we're practicing with people we have mixed or difficult relationships with. And there's a really great, you know, very important kind of pivot or move. When we hit up against a person we want to feel compassion for, but actually we're pissed at, <laughs> right? Or like want to blame or like whatever flavor of like, um, like, may you be happy, but you know, it's your fault, <laughs> right? I wish you great peace. If you stopped doing that shit, you wouldn't need it. You know, like just like real, like not actually able to open up. You can turn in that moment, like, I have so much compassion for people like me who struggle to feel the love they want to feel for others. I have compassion for people who struggle with forgiveness, you know, and you do the Tonglen actually for people like you who are struggling instead of just you, like you open it up. I love that one. I really, cause you know, it's real and it is, it's hard. You know, especially people who've hurt us. And it's so funny how they always pop to our mind. We're like, who should I practice for? Oh, that really hard person. Like, why? Why can't it be someone who's so deserving of our care? Like we often choose because they are like, you know, they're there's like low level, often draining energy in the background. And we want to find a way to recover and repair. And this whole healing journey of being embodied in this lifetime is how do we learn to repair with difficult people? You know, some of whom, depending on your worldview, you've been with through lifetimes and they show up in all these different forms, right? And you're like, you again, like, no, <laughs> like, no, no, no. And then you try to exile them for your life and then they show up in like another form. So we actually like do have to learn to work with our difficult people. They never go away. And it can be really helpful to have as much forgiveness for ourselves along the way and care for ourselves. And, you know, I, does anyone here feel like they've successfully over time forgiven someone? Yeah, it happens. It does, but it doesn't like happen when you want it to happen, you know? And I really, I've actually um, on retreat been like gifted forgiveness. Like all of a sudden it was like, you have forgiven. That. And I was like, Oh, I wanted this for so long. You had that too. It's such a trip. Like just arises. Just arises. Yeah. You know, so like stop with the agenda of like when you're going to let go of the, your anger towards this person and just keep working it and keep working your heart. So thank you, Fiona. Great question. Okay. So to, to the texts here. Yeah, I just, um, I do, I just want to kind of every time I teach this, really honor, and I, I feel so moved that this text has been carried for so many centuries, you know, and made freely available for people for so many, I mean, I guess, what's the publisher? <laughs> Shambhala makes some money, it's okay, you know, but just this idea that, you know, these teachings have made it this whole time. I just, I feel like it's an ancient technology, you know, that's like meeting us here and that it's relevant and important. And it's relevant and important for how it lives in us because as Kate was mentioning, it really helps us with our intention. And intention or aspiration is so tightly tied to our purpose in life. And our purpose in life is tied to our meaning in life. And a meaningful life is a happy life. When I did work, I, I still do some with the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, a really wonderful resource if folks aren't aware. Just so many articles and videos and all of it on the science of a meaningful life. And one of the main courses that we taught was the science of happiness. But it was a real kind of like shell game. We're like, science of happiness, just kidding. It's actually a meaningful life. 
because happiness is like temporary. It just comes and goes. No one wants, like we all want enjoyment and temporary pleasures are great. But when we say, I just want to be happy, we don't mean like these temporary spikes of enjoyment. We mean, I want to feel a sense of meaning and purpose in my life that's sustaining. And that's what we get through meaningful relationships, through work we do in the world, you know, through artistic pursuits. There, there's a lot of ways we create it. And so looking at this kind of relationship between the intentions and like underneath the intentions in a way, it's like what matters to us? And at the most core level, what, what are the ethics underlying the choices we make on a day-to-day -day basis? And unless you're like a Buddhist nerd or you have a professional association, most of us don't think about ethics all the time. And it sounds like something, you know, like you gotta be sent to an ethics committee if something goes terribly wrong, right? Ethics isn't something that feels like alive with meaning and purpose. But our ethics is really, it's how we make every single small decision. Like, am I gonna try to fit in one more thing today? Am I gonna go to bed early? Am I gonna eat well? Am I gonna see this person? Am I gonna, you know, like all of those, they seem like these minor decisions, but like underneath them, there is this kind of, this network of beliefs and values and, and intentions. Like, what am I doing and why? And often it's, it's a little vague, like, oh, this will feel good that's actually not a great way to ensure like sustained long-term happiness, like seeking our temporary pleasures, avoiding the difficulties. That's, you know, as Shantideva will call later, that is the dungeon of samsara, right? <laughs> and so getting clear on our intentions, it's really important. Like it's really important. It's not just, well, oh, that would be a nice thing to do when I have time. Like that is the core for how we lead a life that feels meaningful and happy and good. And so it, it's, you know, the intention, may I wake up for the sake of all beings. That's like the aspirational bodhicitta. It sounds really out there or it can, but again, I, I actually think it's very natural. If you just think about the human species, how we existed for 99% of, um, of the time we've been on this planet, we were so interdependent. You didn't even need a word interdependent because it was like, right, that's how we lived. And so interesting that Thich Nhat Hanh had to bring this word interbeing to remind us all in the modern era of Buddhist practice that we do this for each other because we are here for and with each other. So this idea of being, you know, kind of in, intimately tied to the well-being of others means that we need to learn how to help everyone, support everyone, encourage everyone to have a sense of intention and meaning and purpose. And actually to Ken McLeod, uh, KJ, I heard this interview with him back in 2020. And I, I might've said this um, last week too, because it struck me so deeply. He said, bodhicitta isn't just this altruistic idea, like I up here wanna help you down there get free. Bodhicitta is, I see so clearly how amazingly beautiful you are and I want you to see it. I love that, right? It's a very different liberatory approach. Instead of this, you know, kind of, I'm going to come in and save you. It's like, I'm going to help you get free from the delusion that you aren't already free. It's, it's really beautiful. And so when we say alleviate the suffering, yes, of course, we want everybody's basic needs to be met. We want them to have food and housing and psychological safety and not live in fucking war zones. And um, we also want, though, to focus on the suffering that is secondary and constructed. A lot of Buddhism is really caring about that secondary suffering, the second arrow, right? We want people to not just be um, having all their basic needs met, but able to actually rest in their own hearts and minds. And that means free from these delusions of separateness, free from this kind of constant grasping what feels good and pushing away from what feels bad. So that's where the Ken McLeod quote of, I want you to be free from suffering, my, 
my bodhicitta is I want you to see how beautiful you already are. I don't want you to suffer from this idea of being separate, less than, not connected. They're very beautiful. Um, and, you know, just to say one more time, our ability to alleviate suffering of other beings is not something, it's not like an individualistic pursuit, like I will do this for you. It's really, we all need to do this with each other for each other, and that can get a little lost. Um, okay, so let's start with a little of these texts here. So the last one that we read last week, we kind of read the opening text, which is often this kind of big hand wave of, I am nothing, I know nothing, let me give you small texts um, of Shantideva kind of making his way into sharing uh, what he created here. <clears throat> and in this verse, he says, the mighty Buddhas pondering for many ages have seen that this and only this being bodhi, bodhicitta will save the boundless multitudes and bring them easily to supreme joy. And I love what Pema says here. She says, at this point, we might ask, why does bodhicitta have such power? Perhaps the simplest answer is it lifts us out of self-centeredness and gives us a chance to leave dysfunctional habits behind. Moreover, everything we encounter becomes an opportunity to develop outrageous courage. When we get hard, when we get hit hard, we look outward and see how other people also have difficult times. When we feel lonely or angry or depressed, we let these dark moods link us with the sorrows of others. No matter how dark and gloomy or joyful and uplifted our lives are, we can always cultivate a sense of shared humanity. So there's a really powerful thing to see about bodhicitta, which is our ability to recognize that any of our own suffering is so intimately tied to the suffering of others not separate, not different. And there's these beautiful research studies you see that <laughs> often people, when they are in a more difficult stage or phase of their life, they have more empathy. It's like, we kind of know that intuitively, like suffering makes us more porous, more sensitive, more caring to others. And that doesn't mean like misery loves company, like let's all feel downtrodden together. It's more of a, I am not alone. And like, this is a natural part of life. So there's something very beautiful there. And um, some of us, uh, Cage and I, and, and a couple others were on a retreat at exactly this time last year with uh, Kondro La, beautiful teacher. She's called the Oracle. Um, she's a, a close um, associate of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and kind of a shamanic figure who you know, has brought forth these teachings um, that she is receiving from teachers of past centuries and kind of embodies this wisdom and transmits it through her, her person. It's this cool, more mystical, magical side of um, Tibetan Buddhist practice. And when we saw her, I don't know if you remember, Cage, all she talked about was bodhicitta. And her entire, like we went, I was kind of like, whoa, is she going to fly? This thing, like, thing's going to move around the room. Not really, but like, she's pretty. And she was just like, bodhicitta, 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 like let go of self-centered grasping. Like you want to be free? Let go of self-centered grasping. And it was just coming through her so beautifully uh, and such an encouragement. I can only do my best to um, share what she shared, which is, like every single thing that you want in your life, everything you want to support, everything you want to achieve, it will become infinitely easier if you let go of this self-centered approach to it. So it doesn't mean we let go of self-centered grasping and we just become like a blob. We still do what we need to do, but there's a little less of that like orientation back to me, back to me. And I remember when I was doing like work as a frontline uh, mental health provider, worked here at the emergency room at SF General. And one of the things I loved about my work there is like, I didn't exist for the eight to 10 hours that I worked. 
it was just like, I was just there with and for others. Like, I remember being like, I never look in the mirror when I'm here, <laughs> you know, because it's like, whoa, who, like, why? Who's, who's looking in the mirror? You know, also it's, it's a pretty rough place. It doesn't really matter what you look like. Um, but it really is that sense of like, I am here to be of service. And there's not that self-referential, like continuing, like, am I good? Am I okay? Are we okay? Am I okay? Whereas, unfortunately, I do think a lot of the um, ways that many of us engage both socially and even professionally is so self-referential. Honestly, I think the fact that many of us work online looking at ourselves all day, bad news. Bad news for ego grasping. <laughs> I remember when we all went online the pandemic and I was like, whoa, I'm 40. Like, yeah, I see that. <laughs> like, I had an idea of what I look like and who I am. But now I have to, like, be with it, right? So I do think there's a way, like, there's ways that we can help ourselves kind of loosen the self-centered grasping, you know, just trying to say, like, yes, this precious human body, it's on its way right? It was born, it will die. Like remembering impermanence and remembering sickness, old age, all of us, every single one of us remembering that all the time, you know, that helps loosen some of the grip to this, this form in this way. And then, you know, there is also putting others forward, you know, putting others before us. And it's, it, it, it can, yeah, it can feel a little like performative or like, am I really, but just, try, you know, and notice how it feels. Again, most of us do this naturally anyway. Um, okay, so the next verse here, those who wish to overcome the sorrows of their lives and to put flight the pain and suffering of beings. So both those who wish to overcome the sorrows of their lives and to put flight the pain and suffering of beings. Those who, wish, those who wish to win such great beatitude should never turn their backs on bodhicitta. And so what Pema says here is in terms of overcoming the sorrow of our own lives, he is addressing this foundational teaching of the cessation of personal suffering. And that when we talk about ending the pain of others, it's really this idea coming from Mahayana tradition that we need to free everybody. Um, and it's, it's just this, you know, that, that this aspiration can hit on both. And I love, she really brings up here, which is such an important point <clears throat> is not just, I will avoid my own suffering by overly focusing on others, AKA codependency. Um, it's that in order for us to really um, have a clear understanding of why we are focusing on relieving our own suffering, we have to have this real shift and think we want to end our personal suffering so that we can be helpful to others and put an end to theirs. And so that's, again, back to Cage's question. We want to end our own suffering, and that feels good. And it doesn't stop there. Like there's another role, there's another round. It's because it also is a way for us to help others. And um, she says, at some point we realize what we do for ourselves benefits others and what we do for others benefits us. Just that simple reciprocity. <clears throat> so I wanna give a moment here. Any questions or comments? on this whole bodhicitta thing. Ego grasping, they're all big comments, words. Any questions or reflections? Yes. We can you. There we go. Thank you. I don't know if this sort of falls um, in the same sort of category as, as some of the other experiences that folks are talking about. Um, I think we start off with one person that was, you know, feeling really calm and stable, another person that sort of had, um, you know, sort of a, a um, more complicated situation. And then I think if you kind of go along that spectrum, you get to a situation where it's like someone who's just downright adversarial, right? And so, you know, and I think we all can relate to this, whether it's 
you know, your schoolyard bully or, yeah. you know, you've gone through a divorce or, mm. you know, you're in a lawsuit with somebody. And it feels like, you know, some situations you may be put in where it's sort of, it's like you or them, right? It's like they're coming for you and <laughs> who's it going to be type right. thing. And so, you know, and you talked about this idea of what are you energizing? And when you get into that state, that adversarial state, you know, you really start energizing that, hmm. right? And so, um, and so it was just interesting to come here, right? Because this is a very sort of compassion, warmth, right type thing. And I think you kind of touched on it when you said, you know, in those situations where there's a difficult person, you can then turn that compassion inward. And so, you know, I guess I, I, I'm just curious, do you feel like even when it sort of gets to that extreme, that that's still a sort of the approach to sort of overcome that, that those circumstances? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I think um, both and, as always, I think like that fundamental idea of common humanity is it means that no matter how harmful and even harming this person is, there's some recognition this person wants to avoid suffering. This person wants to enjoy peace and ease just like me. So when you said, um, when you realize it's either us or them, is that what you said? Yeah, me or them, yeah, exactly. Me or them, yeah. Um, I thought you said, when you realize I am them. And I was like, yes, that's what you do. You realize that. And I was like, oh, no, no, it's me or them, sorry. Uh, so, cause I, you know, I do think that I, that like, just like me, that kind of famous phrase actually that Ram Dass worked into a practice of any person has had suffering we don't understand they've had difficulties we don't and understand and in the in the second half of this book we get into a lot of those kind of direct working with especially anger towards other people but i think the simple pith of it is they are just like you you don't have to wish them compassion immediately though so you can have that like i understand that you know this is them doing their best that phrase i love they're doing their best yeah I mean, it can be very dismissive, like, oh, they're doing their best, you know, but like, to, like, kind of, and even though, and while they are being especially actively harmful, we do not have to engage in a, like, let me embrace them. Let me enfold them. We need to actually like take care of ourselves. And again, you know, the 999 arms of compassion. So we may like, may you be happy and free. And I blocked you from my phone that's the intention behind the blocking right so like just like you said don't energize the aggression because subtle like when we especially when we catch on to like subtle aggression throughout our day i don't know if anyone's ever taken that dip a lot there's a lot there's a lot of like the, and, the, and when we're energizing that it does it creates so much momentum and it can be actually hard to sit in practice hard to fall asleep at night, you know, hard to feel present. So when we think of what's the most compassionate thing for my mind to be at ease with this, it's to like, as much as possible, loosen the aggression. How do I loosen the aggression? Being compassionate to myself. And like, even in an abstract way, this person is also deserving of care. I might not be right ready. And I really don't think you should practice before you're ready. That's maybe a little controversial for this text. They'd be like, do it all the time for everyone, no matter what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think it's okay to have the view, like hold them in the view of care without practicing. Right. Yeah. Cause it, it almost felt like that, you know, if you are in that situation where you feel like there's a threat and you started going through like Maslow's hierarchy, you know, if you're in a space where you, know, you don't feel safe, it's very hard to self-actualize and start to be compassionate yeah. with other peace, people. Right. So I don't know if I think there's a hierarchy. I mean, in a way, like, I think compassion would be like the base of it, yeah. as opposed to this high part, I see. you know, because it, it really is like we literally every cell in our body, the bones, all the nutrients that made this body possible are, are of compassion. Yeah. You know, like we live on compassion. We don't see it because everything's like in supermarkets and blah, 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 but like, really, there's like we're living with compassion yeah, yeah, yeah. and it is natural and that self-protection and anger has a really meaningful role when it's clear. It just gets all contorted when we get self-centered with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so letting that anger energy help us get through difficult times because it's energizing and then compassion. I see.
see. Oh, yeah, great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, please. So if I make a vow or a commitment and then I can't keep it, it erodes my sense of mm. self or like ability, you know, mm. then my word means nothing and other commitments I make. So mm. therefore, the Bodhisattva vow is really conflicting for yeah. me because I'm very aware. I'm like a profoundly selfish person. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'm very often under caffeinated and underslept <laughs> and like really cranky. And so, and um, I feel I've asked this like years ago to you. Yeah. Like it's aspirational, but I still have trouble with it. But then yeah. I'm like, okay, well, I didn't make the vow, so whatever. That's right. I'm also not moving towards it. So yeah. I just want to hear more about like yeah. how you deal, how you navigate. Oh my gosh. The vow you can never keep. I know. That's such a great question. Again, <laughs> always. Yeah, no, I wish we had like the confessional in Buddhism, right? So we just like, <laughs> be like, no, you're good. <laughs> Actually, confession is a big part of Buddhist practice. Like um, Chogyam Trimpa would talk about like neurotic self-thought confession. Like, you know, just to get clear on how neurotic we are, we share our most neurotic thoughts with everyone. Um, I would have loved to be in that circle. So wild. But I think for the Bodhisattva vow and and it's somewhere in one of these chapters, I can't remember where, but yeah, it's a vow you renew every day. And there isn't like, oh, you've broken it, you're bad. And so it's like, how do we toe the line between, well, because I renew it every day, I guess I can break it every day. Um, and like what you're talking about, which is like holding ourselves to that internal like sense of accountability. And again, no one loves this paramita, but discipline. Like discipline is so beautiful. Like I think it, I think there'd be a better word in translation. It's it to me feels like dignity. Like I am holding myself to the dignity of this vow. And if I falter, I hold myself with compassion for my faltering. And often, and it could be interesting to explore this just for a week, you know, in the morning you take the vow, and in the evening before you go to bed, you kind of really reflect. What are the ways that I didn't show up? for this vow, but would do so not with this like self-castigation, but with this w real desire, may I see more clearly. We're never gonna learn by like trying and failing and trying and failing. It's really like trying, reflecting, trying again. So that's my advice. Thank you. Here we are somehow at the end of this night. I made it through two verses, guys. Um, <laughs> it's like eight lines, but yeah, that's good. I wouldn't be sad if we did this for like a year. I love this book. Okay, so let's return for a moment to the breath and the body. And renewing and refreshing a sense of, yeah, this possibility of bodhicitta. May this heart awaken for the sake of all beings. And imagining that if there's some energy that has been generated this evening in practice and reflection and connection, that we symbolically offer up this energy and for this beautifully outrageous aspiration that every being could know belonging, every being could know peace and ease, that each and every being seen and unseen of all times could be free. So happy to be with you all.